We've made it to the end. This is our 31st and final question in our series of looking at Catholic questions and answers and comparing them with Scripture. This last question, is Jesus sacrificed again at every Mass? Is Jesus sacrificed again at every Mass? This comes from the New Catholic Answer Bible. The New Catholic Answer Bible is authorized by the Board of Trustees of the Confraternity of Christian Doctrine and approved by the Administrative Committee slash Board of the National Conference of Catholic Bishops and the United States Catholic Conference. So this is official Catholic doctrine here. Uh, when we read this, what they're going to do, and I'll tell you in advance, there's scripture in the book of Hebrews that says Christ was offered once for the sins of, of man. And what they do then is they say he's only sacrificed once but he's offered every time. So they, they're trying to get around what Hebrews says by saying, well, yeah, he's really only sacrificed again at every Mass. No, but yes, because they want to try to get around Hebrews, and we're going to find that they can't do that. There's a host of other problems with this. That's not even the biggest issue, and we'll get to that later. Okay, so is Jesus sacrificed again at every Mass? The dazzling vision of St. John in the book of Revelation is perhaps best known for its depictions of horrific worldwide ca catastrophe. Yet at the heart of this text stands a poignant figure full of mercy, ho hope, and glory, the Lamb who was slain for our sins, Jesus Christ. See chapter 5, verse 6. Biblical scholars have pointed out that at one level, in presenting us a vision of heaven, Revelation also provides us a glimpse of the Mass, our foretaste on earth of heaven's wedding feast of the Lamb. Uh, basically what they're saying is that since you've got this vision after the cross in heaven of Jesus Christ as the Lamb, then God sees Jesus Christ as the Lamb, and He always sees Him as the Lamb, so then He can be offered again every time the priest blesses the, the bread and the wine, and it makes it the literal body and blood of Christ. Uh, let's go to that passage that they mentioned in Revelation 5-6. Because what's interesting is that even in that passage, even though he's called the Lamb, God is not the one recognizing him as the Lamb. Revelation 5, verse 5. Revelation 5, 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. So according to verse 5, one of the elders, one of the 24 elders around the throne, says, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when John looks at him in verse 6, he says, Stood a lamb. So... God says he's the lion. In other words, at the second coming, he's going to come as a lion of the tribe of Judah and destroy the enemy. But John, because he is not in his glorified state, he's still a man on earth, he sees Christ as man does, as a lamb. He sees them by faith as someone who is sacrificed for his sins. So they use this thing that says, well, it's about the lamb and God sees him as the lamb, but really... He only sees him as the lamb in terms of the sacrifice for sins. And since that sacrifice has already been done, now he is seen in the future state as the lion. So yes, he is the lamb of God, uh, but that's already taken place such that even in the book of Revelation, he's called the lion, and it's only man seeing him as the lamb. Okay, uh, go back to what the Catholics say. Catholics agree with other Christians that the divine sacrifice made once for all, described in Hebrews 7.27, is a unique historical event, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But Jesus' sacrifice, though occurring in the past to us, is nevertheless always present to God, because God himself does not exist in time as we do. John's vision depicts this eternal reality, the presentation of Jesus as Lamb to the Father, appears to be an ongoing occurrence. Again, it's, he's seen as a lion. But anyway, um, appears to be an ongoing occurrence from God's perspective, timeless, 
long after the death of Jesus. Our Savior, Scripture says, has a priesthood that does not pass away, Hebrews 7, verse 24. Uh, if you want to know God's perspective on it, um, look at, and, and you're in Revelation, look in Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 16. Revelation 19, 16. Referring to Jesus' second coming, it says, He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's all in capitals. So God isn't looking at Jesus in his second coming and saying, The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He did that at his first coming. The sin of the world's already, already been taken away, so at the second coming, he is seen as King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Look over in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Right there, there are five titles of the Lord Jesus Christ that will last forever, for all eternity, for the, uh, the everlasting kingdom. And those titles, you do not see Lamb. You see Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So uh, the Lamb title is just for man who is redeemed and uh, by the sacrificial Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not God ever sees him as the Lamb. God sees him as the mighty God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He sees him as the eternal God. He sees him as the, the blessed and only potentate over there in 1 Timothy 6. He's not called the Lamb in God's eyes. He was the Lamb for a period of time for that sacrifice. That was it. Okay, going back to what the Catholics say. In this light, then, we can understand how the Mass is a representation of Jesus' historical, one-time sacrificial death on the cross. In every Mass, the priest reenacts Jesus' priestly actions at the Last Supper, offering once more His body and blood. And I want to focus on that. Offering once more His body and blood. So they say, well, the sacrifice was once it was historical, but yet they say that He reenacts that... And he offers, it says, the priest offering once more his body and blood. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And we're going to see when it comes to Christ. Uh, let's see. Uh, Hebrews 7 verse 26. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice. See, it's offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So Jesus Christ sacrificed on the cross. He takes his own blood, goes into the Holy of Holies in the heavens, and he offers it up himself. Once, verse 28, For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. So, one time sacrifice, once sacrifice, and they acknowledge that, but what they don't offer, they say, the Catholics say, the priest offering once more his body and blood. Here we're told that the high priest on earth they have to offer sacrifices for themselves and then for the people because of their sin. But Jesus Christ is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. He is the only one qualified not only to be the sacrifice for sins, but he is the only one qualified to offer up his body and blood as the sacrifice for sins in heavenly places. And we're told that it says, For this he did once when he offered up himself. Jesus Christ offers up his sacrifice, not the priest. He did it once, not many times, not at every Mass. Let's look at other scripture we'll just read. Uh, Hebrews 9, 25. 
nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Once offered. Uh, Hebrews 10, verse 10. Hebrews 10, 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down on the right hand of God. It's done. There is no more offering. He set down. Verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Verse 18, Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Only one offering. Look in verse 26, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And then go over to uh, Hebrews 6, verse 4. Hebrews 6, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. We we're just told about these people. So these are people who are saved and um, they have fallen away basically. It says it is impossible for those. Verse 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Why is it impossible? Seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. What these verses say is that every time a Catholic priest says that this is the body and blood of Christ shed for you, they are putting, they are crucifying to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. So not only are they not glorifying God, not only is that not the literal body and blood of Christ, but they are putting Christ to an open shame every single time they say the transubstantiation occurs. And we've seen verse after verse here in Hebrews, he is offered once. They say, the Catholics say, in every Mass, the priest reenacts Jesus' priestly actions at the Last Supper, offering once more his body and blood. And we're told he only offered it once. And he didn't offer it at the Last Supper. He offered it in heavenly places, in the Holy of Holies, where the sacrifice really counts. That's where God is. The blood has to be applied where God is. He is in heavenly places. That's where He dwells. So the blood is applied there, and that covers the atonement for your sins there. Okay, going back to what the Catholics say. Um, but Jesus is not sacrificed again in the Eucharist. Rather, His unique sacrifice is made real and present to us here and now because it is a divine reality that transcends space and time. Again, they're saying there's only one sacrifice, but it's offered again. And we've seen scripture after scripture in Hebrews that says it was only offered once. And it's not offered by a Catholic priest. It's offered by Jesus Christ himself in heavenly places where the sacrifice really counts. For this reason, the Mass is not merely a service of praise, preaching, and fellowship presided over by a pastor around a meal table, the Mass is truly a sacrifice offered by a priest upon an altar. So again, they admit that they are offering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ over and over again. And we've already seen it was offered once, and it was offered by Christ. Though some Christians insist that priests and altars belong only to the Jewish temple sacrifice of the Old Covenant, these elements also play a role in the New Covenant in Christ's blood. See Luke 22.20. The book of Revelation in particular tells us of the altar with the gold censer in the temple where the sacrificed lamb, Jesus, reigns. Um, so we've shown clearly, they say that Jesus is not sacrificed at every Mass because they say that his sacrifice is only once, but they say he is offered every time. And it's interesting through the Hebrew uh, verses that we've seen in the book of Hebrews that it clearly says he is offered only once. So... Um, their doctrine is false, and the danger is they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. But here's the thing. 
beyond all of this, you know, you look at this, and this is blasphemous enough. They put him to an open shame. It's, you know, it's terrible what they do. Uh, they'll get a special punishment, uh, extra hotness in the lake of fire as a result of what they're doing. But this here, what we've covered, is not the worst part. The worst part is that the death of Christ does not save you alone. I mean, you look at people like Muhammad, Buddha, Gandhi, people like that. They all died. Jesus Christ died. Muhammad's blood does not save you. Gandhi's blood does not save you. The Buddha's blood does not save you. Salvation only comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And the reason is because of the resurrection. It's the power there in that resurrection. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Why does his blood save us and not Gandhi's or Muhammad's? It's because, verse 19, Ephesians 1, 19, What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? This is the power to take you from a life of sin and bound for the lake of fire and seat you in heavenly places and give you eternal life. The power, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The power to save you is not in the blood of Christ. The power, I mean, it is in the blood of Christ, but the power, as a result, uh, the power comes from the resurrection. If Christ stayed in the grave, he would be just like Muhammad or Gandhi or anybody, any other good person who has died. There is no power in the grave. The power is in the resurrection. So the only reason that you have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, is because of the working of his mighty power to usward who believe, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Look over in chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, or made us alive together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians 15, 16. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. If Christ died on that cross, and he never rose from the dead, you're going to the lake of fire. Everybody is going there. Because his blood cannot raise you from the dead and seat you with Christ in heavenly places. Because he's not there. He's dead in the grave. That's why Muhammad's blood doesn't save you. That's why Buddha's blood doesn't save you. That's why Gandhi's blood doesn't save you. Only the shed blood of Christ saves you because of the resurrection. And so the great error in the Catholics is even if transubstantiation is true, which we've shown it's not, but if it's true, then Christ's sacrifice is offered every time that the Mass is given. Well, if it's offered up and there is no resurrection, because there's no, uh, the only thing that's done is Christ's death is done again, uh, offered up, then if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. So if what the Catholics are saying is true, then Christ is dead again, but he's never raised to life. There is no resurrection. You go to a Catholic church, you see Christ, he's still on the cross. They never take him down. And if Christ is on that cross, and as that sacrifice, and he is never raised from the dead, there is no power in that. So if what they're saying is true, that which is not, we've already shown, but if Jesus is sacrificed at every Mass, then the only way there's power in that sacrifice is if he is resurrected at every Mass. And there is no resurrection. They never claim that. So if what they're saying is true, even if he is sacrificed again at every Mass, 
or even if he's offered again in every Mass, they are yet in their sins because there is no resurrection. And that's the danger of this. Not only are they crucifying the uh, Son of God afresh, and that's why we're told in Hebrews 6, 4, that, or 6, 6 that we read earlier, that if they shall fall away to renew them again in the repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Um, look over in Hebrews 10. That's not the verse I was looking for. Hebrews 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Since there is no more sacrifice for sins, it was only offered once. If it's offered a second time, it's no good. Because there is no resurrection. And if what they're saying is true, then all that the Catholics have is a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. And as Hebrews closes in chapter 13... Hebrews 13, uh, I believe it's in Hebrews 13, uh, Hebrews 12, verse 29, Hebrews 12, verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. They will be consumed by the fire of the lake of fire, if what they're saying is true. So thank God that he is only offered once. And that was enough. And he's not crucified over again. He's not offered again because he was only resurrected once. And if he's only resurrected once and he has to be offered again, all we can look for is to be consumed by the lake of fire. So, is Jesus sacrificed again in every Mass? They say no, but he is offered again. We've seen that's not true. And if it was true, everybody goes to the lake of fire because there is no resurrection at every Mass. So, uh, thank you, everybody, who watched all 31 questions. Um, if you have um, questions about anything I've covered, send an email to BibleDivider at gmail.com. B-I-B-L-E-D-I-V-I-D-E-R at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.